Welcome to Nurses and Hypochondriacs, Maggie Ortiz, Advocates for Nurses. Hey, how are you? Doing great. How's it going, Maggie? So I'm so uh, happy that we're finally doing this. I know it's taken a little bit of time. <laughs> my end. Um, but uh, I'm so excited to do this. And I'm kind of glad we're doing this now because it um, seems like the dust has settled a little bit from all the drama that's been going on so that we could talk about it normally without so much chaos going on and so much heated argument. But tell us about yourself, Maggie. Sure. I've been a critical care nurse for 22 years. Started in the ICU before like residencies was a cool thing. I did a residency thing for a year, moved to the ER, uh, interventional radiology, interventional ca cardiology, pre-op, PACU, endo, IR. So pretty much everywhere in the hospital, <laughs> but labor and delivery, and that's by choice. Um, and then I spent a small stint at the border nursing uh, we'll go into that a little bit more detail, came back out and started just becoming an, an advocate. I recently just left the cath lab doing patient and nursing advocacy. So not currently right now at the bedside. Okay, awesome. So what made you go into nurse advocacy? I mean, you said you were working for the Board of Registered Nursing in what state, Texas? Yes, ma'am. Yep. And so when I, so I had left a freestanding emergency room, I was working in the freestanding and just like all nurses have their own story, management was messing with my hours. So I was like, you know, forget this. So I started looking for other jobs and I saw one posted for the Texas Board of Nursing as an investigator. So I applied for it, interviewed, and I, you know, received the position. When I was there, I did not feel like we were extending nurses a due process, a word now that I've become more comfortable with. But when I was told, and it was the culture. And we all know what the culture is. It's not written about. It's there. And when I was told they're all guilty, don't read their response. I really had to take a step back. At that time, I had been a nurse for 15 years. So I knew that there are things that were happening and I wasn't comfortable with that. So I, I left and came back on out. Oh, wow. And then you, how did you go about starting your own nurse advocacy business then? Like, how did you get this all together and helping other nurses? Sure. So I've been on the journey about seven years. So at first I was a little weary because anytime you start speaking out against the board, right? Oh, that's yeah. your, I mean, come on. We as nurses, no, that's not. So I just started saying things that were concerning me. And then another re nurse reached out to me. It was her and I, Darlene Nelson actually who have done the advocacy work in this state. So her and I connected and just started helping nurses under investigation, started looking at that process. And then I really started looking at, so if you are under investigation and you do have a concern and you think you're being retaliated against, for example, who will you tell? So I started doing that and found that there was no one, no one oversees the border nursing in Texas. And that is true now. Wow. Um, it's seven year research. Yes. Across the nation. And I think that's pretty <laughs> unanimous with all boards, as we saw with the whole Redonda Vought case in Tennessee, correct? Yeah. And there were right in that instance, there were a couple of different entities involved, which a lot of nurses don't understand that civil can cross over to administrative. But interesting enough about her board, I spoke, you know, to her attorney, Lori, and I thought it was interesting that they, uh, the board initially did not find her negligent. They came back and then revoked her license, which in my short experience over the last seven years is uncommon. Normally, like when I was at the board, we would let the criminal case resolve because the board is poor. It doesn't have money. So why not just let the criminal case resolve? Because once that's resolved, right, then the board just uses that against you. They open up your case. They just wait for the criminal and then they, but interesting in her case, which I did find interesting that the board took a position and said, no, we are not going to sanction her license initially. But I don't think that they even dreamed that it would become a criminal case. No one did. Oh, wow. I know I was surprised myself. And um, hold on, I'm going to take a little bit of a break here. I have to zoom. I thought that was so bizarre with the whole Redonda Va case. I mean, the whole thing was strange. I mean, first of all, it was a three-day case. Uh, 
which I guess because there was only one person involved. The second thing I thought was weird is the expert witness was not so much of an expert. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, I'll let you comment on her because I think you, you know a little bit more. Uh, and then the fact that um, I, I felt that her attorney, the male attorney, didn't fight for her enough. But I mean, then this is my experience and this is where I'm coming from, from this, where I think that there's something else going on behind the scenes, like something else behind the veil that um, is being covered up somehow. And, um, and I'll pull an article as well to kind of uh, show this. But in my experience, so I've had two authors on the show um, and uh, both of them were wrote about criminal cases that involved nurses. One in particular, which was written by John Fox John, which was, I believe in North Texas, that took place a few years ago. I think it was in 2012 and it, his book is called Killer Nurse. And it's about the LVN who was working at DeVita Healthcare, who was injecting bleach into the, um, the lines, the dialysis machines of patients. And so I think over 50 patients had been killed or murdered. And so people saw this woman actually put bleach into these lines, right? The, the witnesses, the patients themselves saw her do this, but yet it took them two years to convict her. And her attorney, which I thought this was very interesting, even though, uh, you know, I think she was initially pleading innocent, but then they found some information where she knew what she was doing this whole time, you know, uh, with killing these people and killing the ones who were actually getting better, not the ones who were sicker for her own personal gain. And um, so her attorney went so far as to try proving that it was DeVita's fault, that there was something wrong with their machine, something wrong with their policies. So I don't understand why Redonda's people didn't do that. I mean, I'm going to pull this article, which I, I sent to you, and it was in med pages, and it's written by an anesthesiologist. Um, yeah, and I have one in stat as well. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. And, and so what it says on here. It is that um, despite numerous advances in anesthesia safety over the years, former Tennessee nurse Redonda Vaught's deadly medication error could have been prevented with a few system-wide fixes that aren't that difficult or costly. Certainly criminal, uh, criminalizing her mistake and charging her or any other nurse with negligent homicide and neglect was absolutely the wrong approach. That's the view of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, an arm of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, whose task force has issued a call to action to hospitals nationwide after studying the circumstances in the Vought case, which I found very interesting. So why do you think the attorneys didn't take that approach, much like in John Fox John's book, Killer Nurse, when we know this nurse had people have seen her kill people, but yet, this attorney still tried to prove that DeVita was at fault. That's a great question because, you know, the Institute for Safe Medical Practice, which is used across the nation. I do expert work, not for just administrative, but for civil law. The last case that I testified in, the Institute for Safe Medical Practice was pulled in. They actually did a whole little podcast webinar on Redonda's case. They wrote articles back. This is an entity that gives us high-risk medications. This is an entity that we use. They spoke out and supported Redonda. I don't understand, but even if you look at the expert witness that gave testimony against Redonda, she had not even read the 300 CMS report. Right. That is criminal. As someone who's an expert witness, that's unacceptable conduct. They should report her to her board. She should have never got on the stand. I would never get on the stand and not have read every piece of material that the attorney has sent me. That is literally a violation because I'm basically a hired gun, right? I'm basically taking money, which you're supposed to not do as an expert witness. I am an unbiased fact finder in it. They should have called the trial, which he said, I would, yeah. the attorney should have been like, stop. Wait, hold on. Until you read that, you shouldn't even be on. Judge, I'm sorry. Wait, hold on. 
She hasn't read the, the expert that they're using, uh, ma'am. She hasn't even read the report. So if she could go and read that and then we'll be reconvened, but unacceptable, unacceptable practice. Yeah, I just thought that was very bizarre. It, um, you know, and I was voicing my concerns when people were um, texting. That's not the full story. That's not fair to any nurse because now that's you and you want the lens taken all the way back and the duty. And I'll tell you what the duty is. Every state has specific laws for expert witnesses that every time that I testify in any state, I have to know that nurse that got on the stand that testified at Redonda had to review the expert witnesses laws for the state of Tennessee when she got on the stand. And that would have been to review every piece of record that was sent to her. And the attorney yeah. said that he sent her the 300 page CMS report. Yeah, it, I mean, that's why I think that there's something else going on. I think it's a little suspect. I feel, and this is, um, you know, this is what my spidey sense is telling me, and I'm very intuitive, and I'll explain why um, after I, I tell my story here. Um, so I think there's something else going on. I really think that they came to her and said, hey, look, this is how it's going to roll. This is what you're going to say. This is what you're going to do, and it's done. Boom. And she was what? like, okay, hold on, hold on. And, I, and I'll explain my story, you know, because I- Why did the DA even pick it up? Why did the DA pick it up? You got to take it up. A, why did the DA pick it up even? We got to take it back. The DA stand. picked oh, it up because, but there's other cases where DAs are criminalizing nurses, which um, I found, which I thought was very interesting. Um, the DA picked it up, they're saying, because it was a uh, political year for them. They're running oh, for see, there it is. So- so that's the problem. The other thing is this DA uh, was teaching for Vanderbilt as well. So these are, so the, here we go. So these are, these are the little red flags in the case. So I think they told her because there's so much drama going on at Vanderbilt, there's a lot of um, like, I think because the CMS wasn't the, uh, the Medi-Cal people coming in and trying to take away their, their it's called CMS, right? Yes. Um, and, uh, and so if they lose that, then they're kind of screwed. Okay. So I think they told her, I, I, we don't know what, she's not going to tell anybody. Well, yeah, they came in and plea bargained with me and da, da, da. I'm sure they told her, this is how it's going to roll. Even if you do serve some time, I was, my prediction was she'll probably serve like one to two years and then they'll let her go and then she'll assume a new identity and go somewhere else or even that like maybe she would have served six months but she even got something better which is you know three years of probation which she just has to stay on her farm you know and um like I said, I don't know if this is true. This is just my speculation. This is my theory, which I am allowed to have. Uh, and and um, so, yeah, because I've seen video of her. Why is she so like flat? I mean, she could be on medication. Right. Sure. This is a big organization. We need to remember Vanderbilt is a huge, yeah, it's huge. huge. It goes way back. Let's talk huge. about Gloria yes. Vanderbilt. You know, the Vanderbilt's Correct. like, if you do the yes. history on them, Correct. they own a lot of land and they are, ooh, they are very, you know, there's all cult connected there. I mean, there's, um, there's some and they don't want any of this political tied to them. Just no. like Baylor didn't want any of the doctor death dive tied to them. They right. literally, Baylor paid to have the, the billboard taken down about Dr. Death podcast. Right. We'll talk about outside it. of them. It was we'll hilarious. They don't, but Vanderbilt right. doesn't want the publicity. They don't want them. this publicity. So, none of them do because in these other cases, when I've had my, uh, my authors on that have, uh, that have written true crime about these nurses who are actually um, serial killers. The hospitals always tried to cover it up. They knew these oh, yeah. people were killing people. I worked at a hospital when I was a new grad, I was 25 years old. There was this respiratory therapist who was killing people. And I thought he was the weirdest guy ever. And I would tell everybody, I go, something's wrong with this guy. And they're like, oh, he's the nicest guy. It's just you, you know, da, da, da. Uh -uh. let me tell you people something. When I say something's wrong, something is usually wrong. Cause this guy, it came out a year later he was killing people. He was killing, oh, he killed again, over 50, 60 people. Bodies had to be exhumed. It was crazy. The hospital knew, his supervisors knew. You know, we had code blues during the, during the holidays. And I would always be like, hey, why do so many people die during Christmas? Like, why are we having all these code blues? And they're like, oh, oh well, you know, people just die during the end of the year or during Christmas, which is bizarre. That's a bizarre thing to tell a new grad, right? <laughs> no, no, this is what was happening. This guy was killing people to better his shift. 
to better his load, his patient load. So he was offing people to get a pay. It's, it's in the LA Times, wow. right? And so the only way that they found out that this guy was killing people, you know, um, was because he confessed. His father told him, he told the story. He couldn't take it anymore. Told the story to his father and his father confessed. And then they even interviewed someone he went to high school with. And this person said, oh yeah, he wanted to help people die when he was in high school. Like he wanted to help the elderly. (laughs) So this was this guy's goal forever. You know, so we need to look at this. You but know? those aren't good for press, press gaining scores because most people don't realize, right? <laughs> that, that I mean, just think about it. An organization, and I learned this in my master's and you know this, an organization is allowed to bill 70% of whatever you get your hip replaced. The rest has to be earned back by press gainy, by core measures. If you don't meet those, then you get dinged, right? And you don't get the rest. Everything is tied to money to yeah. include your reviews and Vanderbilt is subject to that as well. Right. So going back to Redonza, and this is why I'm going to solidify my theory because it's happened to me. You know, I was working at a hospital. Um, it was, I'm going to say the County hospital. I've told this story before. And I, I started working with this doctor and I saw that he was doing nefarious things, you know, um, and it started with scheduling. And so I start. he used to lie a lot to me. And again, I am very intuitive where what happens is I start getting synchronicities and serendipities, you know, and I start putting together the puzzle pieces, you know. Um, And and so um, I remember sitting in the um, secretary's office one day and she was just like, what's wrong with you? And I go, nothing. You know, she was the secretary for the whole department. Right. And um, she goes, are they being mean to you? Like she knew. So she, she gives me this piece of paper with all these names and numbers on it. And she tells me to start calling people and they'll, and they were telling me the story about what was going on. People knew what this guy was doing, you know, and how he was committing fraud. So I, I right out sat with him one day and I told him, you stop this, you stop this right now. I go, you can stop. You can be a better person. He starts shaking. Like he's anytime that someone shakes in front of me, oh, you know, they're something guilty. is wrong, right? So he's like shaking, and um, and I just was like, I, I was like, oh my gosh. And at that time, I didn't know what this was, I didn't know how to use my intuition. Now I know I've studied, had people on this podcast who have explained it all to me, so now I know how to hone it, you know, and um, it is like a superpower. It so is. at the time, I told him, I go, well, I'm gonna go tell your chief you know? And so he, and so he goes, go ahead. And so one of my friends who is a director of anesthesia at the time at another hospital, she's like, Ursilia, you don't think the chief knows? The chief always knows. And go figure the chief knew. So then I'm like, you know, there in, in, you know, these people are, are pushing, or I'm the scapegoat now, you know, one of my friends who's an attorney who was covering other stuff that was going on at the county he's like you need to get out of there these people are gonna kill you they're gonna literally make you look like the bad guy and that's what was happening so one of the higher higher directors she came in and, and this woman was had a lot of um vip status like she knew a lot of very important people she brings me into her office one day she puts a piece of paper in front of me and she's like look we're gonna tell you we're gonna change your title they were gonna give me a higher title they were gonna give me a special office she was gonna pay me from a special account it's the county who has a special account at the county right so (laughs) but all i had to do was shut up and sign this piece of paper that said I was going to do what they were going to say. And she was basically, you know, I've watched The Godfather. I'm Italian. <laughs> she tried to make me an offer, but I was like, what the fuck? You know, for what? For pennies? Not like I'm making a million dollars, you know? I mean, what's at stake here? And so I, and I told my dad, my dad's like, get out. Everybody's like, get out of there. You know, even the human resource person was, was against me. You know, so obviously they like to preclude this fraud, you know, they like to preclude this, this negativity or whatever the bullshit is going on. So I left and I'm like, okay. And then I see this Redonda Vod case where she's just sitting there. I was like, if that was me, I would have fired my attorney right there. And then I would have been like, boom, I know my rights. Uh Uh-uh. 
I have fought so many things on my own and won that, oh, hell no, something else is going on. Then, um, you know, there were a lot of nurses who I like to call them flying monkeys who got on this case and they were, you know, on TikTok, you know, they got tons of followers. I mean, one of them did do an amazing job covering the case at the trial and she was quirky, she was funny, she was great, she was pretty informative, you know, and that's how I was watching the case. And then I started to watch the case on YouTube uh, with the lives, you know, a little bit at a time, I would catch it here and there. But all of a sudden, you know, these nurses uh, organized themselves and uh, because she was charged like $38,000 after she was acquitted and, you know, she got her sentence and everything. Uh, those were just her board of nursing fees. Those right. Were so her board of nursing it. fees, they get them, they raise money and, and in, a, in a week or so they raise, you know, the $30,000 or whatever. Which I think is ridiculous because if I lost my license, I don't know if I'd be paying anyone. I yeah, mean, I paying. would not have paid it. See, this is the thing. It's like, they're not thinking. I go, why would, oh, let's immediately, let's raise money to help her. And I was like, you don't even know the story. No, no, you don't do that. You tell, like, what are they going to do to her? Correct. Take my nursing license away. Yeah, it's already gone. I mean, my unless nurse, she honestly yeah. thinks, right. Unless she honestly thinks in five years, because most states in five years, you can reapply for your license if you get revoked. Probably not in her case, but unless she really believes, and, and maybe they sold her to her as well. Maybe the DA came to her, whomever, just like you said, what's happening? I said, hey, no, come hey, on. Do whatever you sign and we'll let you reapply for your license in five Yay. years. Yes, you don't know that exactly. Correct. You don't know Correct. until they made. So again, them. because why would you pay thirty six thousand dollars for something that you are never never going to have again? I mean, again, you're a law abiding citizen. There are those people. I'm not being disrespectful, but really, probably not. I'd be like, uh, negative. I, I can't afford that. I'm going to use that for my uh, whatever else. But absolutely, right. I could use it to put it in a business. I'll buy a laundromat. Correct. Sorry. You know, right. I'll buy I'll buy a laundromat that'll give me more money. Correct. And not only that, I don't want my nursing license back actually after yeah, five years. Would not would you go back into nursing after that? I would no. Hell no. no. I'd buy a laundromat. I'd buy Correct. a car wash. Yep. <laughs> give her a home. I I they're a making millions of dollars. I would buy a, a car wash and become a millionaire. Boom. And write some a books. funeral home. Funeral homes make funeral home. millions of dollars. They're like one of the highest paid people. Hire a couple morticians, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I thought it was weird. So these nurses go and raise this money. And there was this one nurse with her. I guess she was at her house. And they're like, we have a surprise for you. And it's all solemn, like depressing. You know, they're like, we raise this money for you. Here it goes. And she's like, and Redonda, again, either she's on medication or what. She was like, well, thank you very much. You know, like, like no emotion. No, I was like, I'd be like, oh, that's so awesome. Thank you. You know, and they're like, we're going to go with the media to the board of registered nursing. And this is what got me. She's like, no. She said, no, no media at the board. Oh. So there you go. There you go. Oh, that I, shows you there's some. Yeah, no, I would be having everyone down there with me. Yeah. Huh? I said, I would have everyone down there with me. Thank you. She said, no, we're going to do this in class and we're just going to bullshit class. Come on. These people like destroyed you. You've been all over the media. The <laughs> you know, I saw her thing on, um, what was it? 2020. I saw a little blurb. And again, it looked very scripted and fake. I teach storytelling. I have produced 14 storytelling classes. I've been teaching storytelling since 2017. I don't know how many students I've had, a ton. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with PhD students, mastered prepared students, okay? Uh, doctors have come to my classes. Um, you know- I think they're really uh, worried I know about- I people are lying. <laughs> right. I, I think that you are right, and it could be like multi, multi-faceted. Because I think people, it is, definitely, definitely. People are worried, because again, across the nation what this is there's already a shortage of people and people like above them know that there's already right in my state alone we are number two behind you in california texas is for the nursing shortage i mean it is i mean not only her but the pandemic everything there are a shortage of nurses like myself who want to go to the bedside i mean especially because i like her why, why would i want to continue to practice i would not know <laughs> 
Absolutely not. Because again, I have been shamed. I like you when yeah. I speak out. Like we had a physician here, Dr. DeMeo. He was doing that same thing in the cath lab. He was telling people to show up for, for chest pain to the ER because then we that would cover their insurance. This man was sued. He was an interventional cardiologist, a physician, and an engineer. The only reason why he did not lose his license is because he was all three of those things. You don't think that everyone knew what he was doing? Of course they did. This was a physician-owned facility. Westlake Hospital, yes. Case is public. Absolutely. This man is dead. Amazing practitioner. I have the honor standing next to him, but stenting you up. Once you stent every vessel, now you can't bypass it. And he was not giving patients the, the option. It was actually pretty disgusting. People stood by and watched him do this. Wow. Well, yeah, a lot of hospitals have, um, their interventional cardiologists have quotas. I have a friend who was an interventional uh, cardiologist. He was working in New Mexico at one time. His quota was 300. He had to do 300 patients a year. Okay, so now we're in sales. Yep. Right. No, no, no. I work in the cath lab. We're doing tabbers. We're doing mitral clips. My man's there right now. Oh, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. It is a, you, we all bring a patient down from the ICU who's barely breathing, but we're going to put a pacemaker in him. I'm like, oh, thank God we're going to get the last of their money. I can't give them fentanyl over set. It's not safe. Yeah. It's absolutely not safe, but by God, we're going to put this device in them, give them five more minutes so the hospital can bill them. Right. It is disgusting. As someone's been practicing for 22 years who has a master, it's very hard for me to believe to walk into that. I literally, I told you this, I wear a sheep around my neck because I'm oftentimes told because I'm tired of being told I'm not a wolf yeah. and I will not, I refuse to be a part of unsafe stuff. Exactly. You know, even like that, that patient falls off the table. You know who's responsible? You know who's part of that? I am. I've done expert paces administratively and legally. You cannot put a patient on the table that's not, it's acceptable. And again, you're part of that as a nurse. If you think that falls on the physician, you're a dummy. You are a dumb yeah. dumb if you think that you're not part of that team and can be legally sued, civilly, criminally, and no. administratively. Oh, absolutely. You can. If you have a question about that, call me. Well, yeah, there were those nurses. Um, here, I'm going to pull this. Other I have refused to give sedation. I wrote my master's degree. I created the thesis, a tool for a nurse sedate versus anesthesia sedate. They abuse us, not so much in interventional cardiology, because again, I don't give a shit. When a patient's a STEMI, we don't care if you're sedated, right? That's not the goal. If you're having like a pacemaker or you're doing interventional radiology, we're taking a biopsy or something, yes, you do need to be sedated. But interventional cardiac, we don't give a shit if you're sedated. If you're dying, don't care. You don't need to be asleep. Yeah, I'm pulling this article from STAT right now, and it says the case of Radana Bot highlights a double standard for nurses and physicians, because there was that other case, um, I think it's here, uh, uh, it's, it's a far cry from what happened to William Husel, a former Ohio physician who was acquitted of murder in April for her hastening the deaths of 14 critically ill patients under his care by ordering doses of painkiller fentanyl that were 10 times the amount ordinarily ordered for critically ill patients. Who saw knowingly and with intent ordered the inordinate dosage of medication to patients across the lifespan from their late 30s to their 80s with a variety of ailments ranging from pneumonia to cancer. So there were nurses who did give these doses of fentanyl, okay? And they but are there are several under investigation and there are several being criminally, there are 20 of them, I believe. And wow. I want them to reach out to me. I don't know a lot about this case, but again, if a physician would have wrote an order for that, I would have been like, stop. I bulked when right. Baylor just recently last year put out a, uh, a position about propofol, about they called it end of life or on non-intubated patients, palliative use of propofol. I said, not in my state. I said, absolutely not. Show me where the board of nursing says that I can use propofol in a non-intubated patient. No, and any dumb, dumb nurse. Because again, let me tell you the difference. 1514 in my state says that my license by the state of Texas supersedes the physician order or hospital policy. I don't give a shit what the hospital policy is. What does the board of nursing say? And that's why I reached out. I don't care what Baylor wrote. Who gives a shit? They don't hold my license. The board does. Right, right. It's true. And and so what I find interesting with this Ohio case is that the doctor gets acquitted, but the nurses got their licenses taken away. Well, you not know? yet. Not, not yet. There are some, I believe, that have been suspended because there's a triage process right. at the board. I believe that they formally charged a couple of them. So that means they sent them a letter and then went ahead and said, yes, we find you guilty without it yet being resolved. So right. it hasn't gone to trial yet. 
And I would love to speak to any of these nurses. If you know any of these nurses, please advocates for nurses, have them reach out to me. I will help them again. Just like with Redonda, I don't care what you did. As long as you're not intentionally harming patients, right. you deserve a due process. Honestly, you, you do, you do. I mean, and that's why I think there's something shady with that case. What I saw from the testimony, there was a little bit of testimony that I saw with these Ohio nurses where they were backing up the physician. They're like, why did you give the dose if you knew, you know, they're like, oh, because we trusted this doctor. So this doctor exercises his first, his fifth amendment, right? Right. And he doesn't go up to his board, but these nurses go up and are defending this doctor. What is going on there? Yes. Where, where, no your idea. Soul? where is your soul? Correct. <laughs> and, and not only that, I don't care if you support, support him. Where's your criteria? Like, what am I, what am I titrating to? Yeah. Like a blood pressure of, you know, even as a nurse, again, I'm not saying, because again, you and I both know patients build up tolerance. If a patient's been on a fentanyl drip and I extubate them, a hundred mics is not going to touch them. 200, 300, 400, you may, but then I have criteria yeah. that says, you know, titrate to this, to that, you know, morphine drips are the same on end of life. You titrate to a protocol and you document to that, that covers you, you know, and that's what you're titrating to. It's not, I trusted the doctor. Yeah. No. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty crazy. So, uh, oh, wait, you know, physicians don't do that for us. Discernment. Physicians they don't get on the stand for us. Unless it's, uh, um, unless it's a true thing. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's rare. Like, I'm not saying nervous. never, but it is rare that they will get up and defend us. Yeah. Well, look at my case. I, this guy was, um, doing, he was doing medical fraud. I, I mean, from what I found out, I mean, I told you a little bit more details of the case and I went to uh, people, I went to his chief, his chief didn't even care, you know? And um, he told me uh, if I was gonna go to, cause I told him I was gonna go to ethics and I did send a letter to ethics. He told me, don't put it um, in the computer just to, to print it and to send it to the guy, do it in writing. And so someone else told me, they're like, he's just doing that because then there's gonna be no proof. There's gonna be no recourse of it, you know? Cause if it's in writing, you know, they could destroy it. But then if you didn't digitally, then they can go back and like find it, you know? So right. I went ahead and of course sent him an email on it and also put it in writing. So I love time stamped. I tell people all the time, text it, email it, you know? and you got it. So you have proof you can go back. I mean, if I had just written it, like the, the chief told me to, they would have destroyed it. But look, the chief is telling me erroneous stuff. Like why there are patients involved. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the kids, you right. know, obviously I don't care, you know, but we are in the time of revelation right now. And there's a lot of things coming uh to it's like the blindfolds are coming off on all this shady stuff that's been going on in health we need to have nurse owned hospitals Thank we need to have much. nurses running much. facilities get the I do out. Think that's what's gonna be coming i mean that's how it kind of started that's what flow was doing back in the day i mean um and and somehow it got thwarted and the corporations got oh we can make money on this let's take Correct. over where we have these ceos who have run major companies coming in to run hospitals who have not ever done patient care i always thought that was weird i was i remember when i posed these questions when i was 25 years old and on uh, my first job and i saw the ceo and i was like what does she do like what is her what are her qualifications to be a ceo oh well she runs a whole hospital and now she's like the queen of the hospital dun, 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 park the waters as she comes through you know no patient care none at all not at all and she's I never put a patient in a body bag She's yeah. never had done CPR with her fingers on a child. She's never had seen an assault victim, you know, a nine, 10 year old who's been sexually assaulted and raped or someone who's drowned. No, no, she's never seen, done any of these things. No, no, ma'am. You're right. Right. And so, oh, but people would, you know, uh, I was like, well, why is that guy making $500,000 a year, a million dollars a year, 2 million, Correct. whatever it is, plus bonuses. Why are they making so much money? Correct. Oh, well, it takes a lot to rent a hospital. Uh, no. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then the even more disgusting piece that most people don't let the majority, I would say, of healthcare providers don't know is that if your organization goes magnet, that's driven by the American Nurses Association. Let me say that again. The American Nurses Association puts out, gives you the criteria. 
then their revenue, if they get magnet approved, increases. And you can Google it over a million annually off of whose backs? The nurses. And do you think that our pay increases? Because Baylor did this last year. They went magnet last year, right? No, they do not increase the our revenue, but the hospital revenue. Our interventional cardiologist, the CMO didn't know that. I was like, gee, you didn't know that you guys paid magnet a million dollars or whatever to come here to check out boxes so you would get nothing from it, sir? No, sir. It's well over a million dollars annually if you go magnet that you get to bill. No. Yes, sir. It's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, it, it's all mono e mono. It's like one hand feeds the other in everything you do, you know, and they don't care about the patients. They don't care about the nurses. No. They don't care there, and there was this, money. there was a nurse out of, I, I want to say she was Sweden that was looking to have nurses build on a hospital bill. Anytime that a nurse interacted, whatever it was mm -hmm. that she was trying to, uh, pull together some legislation in her country, just like, you know, the physician, occupational therapy, PT can all bill. She wanted, you know, she's working on that to have, I'm like, that's exactly what needs to happen. Yeah, exactly what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, yeah, there, there's nurses going on in Washington, pushing for nurse ratios. That's great. I mean, uh, California's had that in place since I believe 1998, you know, I remember taking care of 13 patients working on an adult uh, ortho neuro med search floor. And then I moved to pediatrics because it was six to one. I mean, now I think pediatrics is four to one here in California, but that was a long time ago. What's been going like, hello, has, have people been asleep? They're why not, they're why no ratios that in Texas? On? Right. There's no safe ratios in Texas. Now we do have safe Harbor here, but that doesn't mean anything. That still doesn't mean that you can't accept. A nurse just called me this weekend from Plano. She spoke out about unsafe ratios. They blacklisted her. She can't even work in her. Oh yeah, Plano, I like, can't blacklist you. Yeah, can't work. She's like, I have two small children. I can't even work in my own. Cause she, again, she spoke out. Uh, she had concerns asked like, what acuity scale are you using? Cause Texas doesn't have safe staffing. So you're telling me I need to take eight. So are you using Apache score? What are you doing to tell me that this is safe? Have you done anything? You know, because again, in the ICU and different unity in units, we use those tools to staff nurses when you're charging nurse, right? To make sure, because if you have an, uh, a med surge patient who's got every two hour wound changes, you probably shouldn't have six, six patients, right? Exactly. It should be four. So they blacklisted her. She's like for a year, she's not been able to work because she can't find a job. She's had to leave her city, take some travel contracts. She's like, I have small children. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sucks. But it's it's just a crazy world uh out there in the nursing world it just i mean it was ugly to begin with i remember it was ugly when i got into it and i stepped into it like i said right when i started working as a nurse look look what happened to me i'm working with a nurse serial killer this was in <laughs> not nurse serial killer he was a respiratory therapist but i'm working with a serial killer <laughs> and i'm telling people something's not right with this guy oh yeah it's just you okay then uh, our ratios are crazy. Like I'd have to take 13 patients sometimes, you know, ortho, neuro, and med surge. Can you now imagine all we did was pass pain meds, you know, and that's when we were using the fifth vital sign, you know, knocking everybody up and, and it's all piggyback IVs. You know, we had the passive motion machines that you're putting people's legs in and stuff. Uh, absolutely insanity, you know, but that changed and it got a little bit better for us here in California. But then one of the nurse at one of the nurses on TikTok who, uh, you know, um, jumped up to advocacy fame because of Redonda, I'm not going to name who she is, but um, she was all saying, oh, yes, I did a survey of people emailing me and it seems like California is the best state to be a nurse. And I was like, ha, I just almost started laughing. And she was like, it's because they have more unions. Not necessarily. I've worked union, non-union. I've been, I've worked strikes, you know, I, I've been on both sides of the spectrum and I'm going to have to say no, you know, that's not necessarily true. I've worked at a hospital that went union and um, I worked there as a registry and that hospital just totally got destroyed after that, that camaraderie, the, the awesome care that was given, nobody gave a shit anymore. It was all about rules. You know, it was all about, it, it became like Nazi Germany. I, I mean, and it really, really sucked. So um, my whole point with these 
TikTokers who have climbed to fame because of Redonda, these flying monkeys who are claiming to know so much. I was just like, yeah, they're they're reading articles and stuff, but I don't think they know enough. Like, I don't think they know how to get advocacy. Kind of like some of the work that you've done. You've said you've gone to DC, correct? I've not done. I've gone to my capital. I've gone to Austin. Okay. Capital. I, I so live talk here. Talk about so. that. Talk about some of the stuff, and then sure. we'll jump into Doctor Death a little bit in Safe Harbor. Sure. So I do go to the Capitol. Uh, my representative know who I am. I, in my own state, I wrote a bill for an ombudsman for the Board of Nursing. Has not been picked up, but again, I won't let it go. I just keep speaking to my representatives. I'm on a healthcare advisory team. And then we wrote some due process clauses that we want presented. I think working with your representative is very important, especially if you work in a state where there is no oversight for the board. But even just think about this, if you work in a state like yourself where the governor, you fall into the governor, which essentially means the attorney general. So you get your complaint from the attorney general that says that you did whatever. So you sing like a bird to the AG, right? You tell them all your words and then you don't agree. You go to an informal conference, you don't agree. You go to a mediation, you don't, at the mediation, right? You know, the the uh, attorney general is now representing the board of nursing and not you, right? And you just told him everything, right? Now you want to go to onto a trial. You know who the board, he's representing the board, right? And you've already told him everything. So how is that unbiased? Not only that, when you go to a mediation or to a trial, the board attorney, I'm sorry, the board, the judge, the administrative judge, never gets the decision. It's a, it's a, it's a, a suggestion. It's not a final decision. The judge in administrative law never gets the final decision. And again, that's well written about. That is not a just system. So I go to the Capitol. I was screaming there on the 12th when everyone was at their respective capitals. And one of the things I was screaming about was safe harbor, that if you are asked to take an unsafe assignment in my state, there are only two that you can call safe harbor and here you can call it verbally. Lolly Lockhart do, with some other uh, uh, nursing association folks got that made verbal because of Dr. Death. Dr. Death ah. is a, a physician in Texas who came out of Baylor. I did not listen to the podcast. It was, I read some of the stuff, the people around me were all reading it. He's a nurse it is, it in Texas, out of Baylor that basically we let him move along because again, we need neurosurgeons. You can't run a level one trauma center. We need these people, right? And so they just kept moving him along. He basically, I mean, he killed his best friend. I don't know all the details of that, uh, but there were nurses and scrub techs who spoke out about his conduct, who were reported, who were, who were fired because of him, right? And again, that's why other people, nurses started speaking out and people like Lolly Lockhart and the Texas Nurses Association were listening, but this is after how long and then made it verbal because I believe the nurse was scrubbed in, couldn't break scrub to file the, it's peer review. Safe Harbor is a peer review that you call and it's paperwork that has to be filled out by the end of your shift. It is driven by the Board of Nursing and every organization has to have a policy in place for a peer review. And it was created so facilities wouldn't go right to the board. Stop, use peer review. Again, we have people like Lolly Lockhart who really pushed for that, that said stop, going right to the board, peer review your people, and then decide whether it rises to that level. So she made it verbal in the state because of him. Right, and uh, that's crazy. I listened to a little bit of the Dr. Death podcast, and I remember I would listen to it on my way to work, and it creeped me out, so I couldn't listen. I couldn't to listen. It, it, was, it was a it's, lot. It's very, very dark. It, it's very, very heavy. And it, the yeah, that, actually, say that disclaimer because it, it is. If you're going to listen to it, it is. It's it's hard to stomach. It is. It's uh, yeah. So they do have a movie. Out, yes. Dr. Death. Yes. And, um, you know, I've just seen the trailer for it, but I'm sure it's very dark and heavy as well. Yeah. Like the podcast. I mean, the podcast, like it's the little bit that I heard of it was well done. I had friends that listened to it and they were just, you know, thrown back and, and couldn't believe that this guy kept going out of Baylor. Yeah. Out of Baylor, a well-respected, supposed to be organization. And this isn't different. This is not Dr. Kevorkian, who you and I, you know, because we grew up during that during that time. Because a lot of people were like, oh, Dr. Kevorkian. I'm like, no, 
we're talking about someone else. I don't know. I can't remember this young man's name, but he is the doctor out of Texas within the last five years that this just happened. Dr. Kaborking is the doctor from that does like a assisted uh, right, suicide. Assisted Are you suicide. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. No, I think he surpasses Dr. Kaborkian. Oh, and, yeah. um, you know, he was known as like the angel of death, but yes, this correct. Is like Dr. Correct. Death. Um, because but he was two black. different people. what he was doing. Correct. Two different people. Yeah. Two different people. I mean, there's a lot of uh, publicity on him and there's the podcast by Wonderly and there's also now the movie. Uh, which is uh, very interesting. I just want to talk about the California Board of Nursing for just one snippet because I have a very interesting story that does involve me. Um, way back in 2015, 2016, 2017, I believe it was 2017 when this happened, I went to a UCLA Nurses Week um, tea. It was like a like luncheon that they would have every year. And so I try, I would try to go every year to network. And I went to UCLA uh, for my master's program. And I really loved to go and, you know, mix in with the other alumni and I would do a lot of promos. I had written an article um, about when nurse, it's called when nurses smoked in hospitals. And I interviewed the Dean at that time because she was a huge advocate for smoking cessation with nurses. And it, it was a great story that she shared, amazing article. My editor loved it. And I was at just the prime of my nursing journalism career. Like that was maybe my third article that I had published, but I was the one who created all that. I got the idea, I put it all together, did a ton of research and it was just, it, it's a, an awesome article. I'm not just saying that because I wrote it, but this is how awesome it was. A guy from, from Australia contacted me a couple months ago about that article, and he's not even a nurse. I was like, why are you contacting me? You read that article? He goes, oh, yeah, I, I'm an ex-cop, and I'm a smoker, and I just found the article. It just came across somewhere, and I just found it so interesting that I had to contact you on Instagram and yeah, now he follows me on Instagram, which was cool. Awesome. Yeah, so that's how I know that it had such a great impact. So when I went to this luncheon, I was like so excited to talk to the um, dean because she never got back to me to say, oh, I really liked it, I didn't like it. So I was like, hey, did you like my article that I wrote about you? And she's like, oh, yes, it was lovely, thank you. You know, And she kind of poo-pooed me along. And I was like, well, okay. So all of a sudden, there's this guy that they're giving an award to, right? And his name is uh, Joseph Morris. And I guess he went to UCLA at one time. And I was just like kind of confused on why he was getting an award. And I think he was a psych nurse. And I don't know, maybe he had done some research or whatever. But I'm like here going, okay. So they're, they're praising him. And all of a sudden, they say that he is the new director of the California Board of Registered Nursing. And so the Dean also says, oh, we're not giving him the award because he's the director of the Board of Registered Nursing. And I'm like, oh, interesting, interesting, you know? So I go up to this guy and I'm talking to him. I was like, hey, I'm a writer. And he was wanting to write a book at that time. And um, so we're connecting and he tells me that like he lives in Santa Monica and he was gonna be commuting to Sacramento every week. Like that's a six hour plus drive. So who would do, why would you do that? bizarre so right there that was weird his wife was there he's like isn't my wife lovely she's so lovely like I was like okay okay that's interesting all of a sudden there's like all this drama going on at the board of registered nursing within the last couple of years because there are cases that are backed up that nobody's looking at right of complaints so someone finally goes in there and people start to resign and so this guy that got the award um, at UCLA this is what happened to him February 15th 2020 Joseph Morris the director of California Board of Registered Nursing resigned after women he worked with complained of sexual harassment dun 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 there it is and do you see you know I get poo-pooed and I write exactly. this amazing article and this guy gets an award and I'm like, karma is such a bitch sometimes. That's real. Isn't she? Isn't she? Exactly. <laughs> it's not a great story though, how that just comes full circle. Yep. You know, and I, cause I kept going, why are they giving this guy an award? You know, I mean, that Dean is no longer the Dean. I mean, she retired and stuff, but uh, I just was like, 
tis tis. So when I say something, it's... we we need to like listen. You know, exactly. <laughs> My spidey sense is like you know. <laughs> So I tell people, yeah. your intuition is real. You cannot ignore it. You, it. you can't always trust your gut. I mean, especially with nurses, our intuition is on point. You always know that guy's going to code before he codes. Correct. You know? Correct. You always know, kind of like, what is going on here, you know? And um, it's so, so interesting. Well, this has been an amazing, fun discussion, Maggie. Anything else you want to go ahead and, and talk about or add? I think nurses need to get involved in politics. I think that yeah. not enough of us are involved and that's the problem is that we're, we don't, I'm advocating because I want jurisprudence taught in school. Jurisprudence is, I don't really remember it. Maybe we're teaching it now. I don't think it's beat down enough. I don't think nurses really understand their livelihood until, cause you know, nurses call me, right? In the last two weeks, I literally have had five nurses call me. You know how devastating it is, they're crying. Because they yeah. got right the certified letter in the mail from the board of nursing that says honor about this date and time while they are employed at this organization. This is what's being alleged about which this conduct is and what's your response. And you have 30 days to give it. Most nurses don't even know what their due process is. No, most nurses don't know that you should go to the NCBSN, the National Council for State Boards of Nursing, and there are videos about the disciplinary process. And you nurses need to understand what that looks like. If a nurse does not have malpractice insurance, why, why this misconception that they're going to go after me is not true. No, it, it's they feel that the hospital tells them, oh, we have you covered. Okay. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And really tell me about it. Work for a registry or locums, they'll be like, oh, you're covered. No, no, you need to double up, double oh, correct. up. The last trial that I testified literally in February, the hospital was representing the nurse and the organization right? And they, I was on the other side. I don't take anything I can defend. What this nurse did and talking about the culture is just unacceptable. A patient died, right? And I, I can't be a part of that, right? That's what, why did you talk about that case. So she was talking about the culture, like what happened? She said that she took the patient off the telemonitor when there was an order for that to go down to MRI because it was the culture of the unit to take them off the telemetry and send them down to MRI by themselves. And I said, uh, I was writing the questions for the attorney. I was like, um, sir, ask her where the order is to take the patient off the monitor. Ask her what the policy is on that unit. Yeah. Now you and I both know. You Hold can't defend her. that. Yeah, that, you know, if it's not in writing, I mean, I, I don't know where Correct. she is. So I don't know. So, I mean, nursing was kind of crazy before, but it seems like it's gotten more hectic. And say crazy. no, you have to stand up and say I, no. But, but here, here's my thing. This is my theory on why. Um, do you think it's because of the online schools, um, all these new nursing schools that have just popped up just because nursing is a profitable? Yeah. And you've um, talked about it. You've talked about it in the transition because like when flow was around, you know where nursing was actually happening in the hospitals. Now, and this is when they had diploma programs. I'm not saying, but there, there is something to be said about that, right? Again, the diploma program, they started in the school. You're doing actual right. patient care right then and there in conjunction with theory. Why? We should be going back to that. We need to go back to not that. Not the right? other way where these nurses come out and they've never touched a patient. Literally, I work yeah. in the cath lab in they're the ER. They're touching dummies. They're, they're, um, Correct. I went to an interview at a school um, it wasn't at a university. It, it was just, uh, you know, a school that was started by this guy again, who had no healthcare background. He just started the school because it was profitable, you know? And so they had like a medical assisting school there and all of this. Um, and, and I went there for an interview and, um, they had this room with all these dummies. I, I mean, all, all these mannequins and stuff. And, and they're like, oh, it's because this is this is our clinical. We don't get clinical in the hot. We can't do it. It's either insurance or they can't find clinicals or they won't let the students in. There's too much competition with other schools. I just was beside myself. So I think that this is what's going on. Well, if, you know, the other thing and, is someone who, who is taught, they don't let you teach. Like I had been in, before I ever had my master's, I'd been a, t a nurse for 15 years. I had started a million IVs, put in a million Foley's. What they would not let me do was teach students because I didn't have a master's. That has to change. Right. That's BS. 
if you, I don't care if you have an associate's degree and you've been a nurse for 20 years, you can't teach to start an IV or Foley. You can't teach skills. That's not true. Again, you come into the, to the university. We check off all your boxes. Okay, we see you know how to do it. Then you could teach students. Now right. to teach theory, that maybe. But the other thing, my friend had her master's in business and not nursing. She had her master's. They wouldn't let her teach BSN students. She couldn't wow. teach. All she could teach was LVNs. I say not all, but even myself, I could teach LVNs when I had my bachelor's, but I could not teach RNs because I didn't. That's that's insane. Well, now they have um, uh, many of the master's programs are adding the DNP program. Yeah. And many of these students have zero. Correct. Experience. Hold on. Great story. Cool. Correct. I'm working at the Livers Institute here in Austin, right? Just agency, right? Been a nurse for like 20 years go down again. I don't know if they go to a clinic. They said, we need someone. You're not really doing clinic work. Or you're going to drop some lines, draw some labs and start and get some albumin. I was like, okay, they're all pre-transplants, right? So I go, there's a clinical nurse specialist and there's a physician. So patient comes in X, I see him week one. They talk me back, back to come back next week. The physician, please come back. I was like, absolutely. Come back the next Friday, see this same patient. He comes, he looks like shit. And I'm like, oh my, I don't, I've met him once. I was like, oh my God, what's happening? He's like, I've had diarrhea. And I was like, okay. So I put him in a room, drew his lab and dropped the line. I knew what he needs to go to the ER. So yeah. I tell the clinical nurse specialist who had never touched a patient before. She was a nurse, had never, never, ever outside of this place had ever seen a patient. Right. And I go to her and I'm like, hey, sister, you got to come and see him. He looks like shit. No, 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 no. She goes, she's like, no, he's fine. I was like, he's not. So yeah. again, I go, I wait for the doctor to come out. And I was like, oh, 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 hey, Dr. so will you go in and see him, please? He looks like shit. She walks and walks back out, walks, and she's like, will you send him to the emergency room, please? Will you pack him up? I said, yes, I would love to. But because you know why? I had a million years of critical care experience. Right. That clinical nurse experience, if I would have let him go home, he would have died at home. He would have literally probably died at home. And that physician would not have known. But again, it was my years of experience, and we cannot, un we can't look away from that. Experience yeah. is not something... Well well, how do you how do you have a mannequin and then you're in the hospital? A, a, a few of these um, articles that I pulled about that, like some of these nurses were like, "Oh, this patient wants to talk to me too much. I can't talk to them." Yeah. Well, why? Because they're used to dealing with mannequins. You know, that's actually a, a human being. If you don't like Correct. to talk to people, don't go into nursing. Correct. In real estate, you know, I mean, you got to talk to people then there too, but I mean, go into a graphic design or something else. You, but, you should have to be um, like a nursing. I wasn't a uh, nursing. They called them student, student nurse, nurse techs. Uh -huh. I was. Or, too. Yeah. Right. It was equivalent. It was a little bit of above an aid because in yeah, conjunction with the RN. Assistant, yeah. Above yep. a nurse's assistant. Yep. So we're a little bit above. Yes. Yeah, so right. the nurses will come and get me because they knew me. Right. Yeah. I loaded the whole hospital. They knew I was in nursing too, school. Too. So that if I, hey, you want to come start an IV, Maggie? You want to put in a Foley? You right. know what I mean? Yeah. I think all yeah. nurses think should have awesome. to do that. Yes. Yeah. And they need to bring that back again. I'm not sure if hospitals do that, uh, but that was so great. And it was very flexible for me because like I would go do night shifts on the weekend, yep. you know, Absolutely. And they were, it was just whatever they needed. Yep. You know, they would plug me in. So it was very flexible with my, um, my schedule well, and, and just think about all the things that you already overcame the nurses that didn't and i saw this when i was going to school the nurses who didn't do that had hesitation and trepidation about even just walking into the room where well, right. i did not i'd already given baths i've already knew the layout of the hospital i already knew that where you're already that and again imagine you're a new nurse you're just overcoming that as well if you've never done that stuff that's a disservice to you right because again i didn't have any hesitation i'm just learning the nursing stuff because i've already given baths i've already walked into a patient's room i already know what this looks like i don't have any problems doing that so i think that i agree the, we're pushing out nurse practitioners who've had no clinical experience, <laughs> yeah. the RN programs. I mean, nurse practitioners who have no RN experience, stop it. I mean, that's yeah. insane. I, I work, I, um, I have a couple of clients on my own that I cover their clinics for. And at one of the clinics, they were like, you're so good. And you're so, I'm just laughing at them. I go, this is hard work. I mean, I do see a uh, high load of patients there. I see a lot of patients there. Uh, but I've been doing this since what 2005 being an MP and, and being on my own, you know, and I cover several clinics. I've been working locum since 2017. Uh, you know, I, I've, 
I, I, whatever, you know, I have my, my background, but they were telling me some of the girls that were coming in who were new grad MPs, they said one had to bring her parents. I almost started, I almost died. Wait, wait, like, wait, stop. Wait, hold on. Yeah, the <laughs> other MP told me, she goes, I, she, the, she's like, wow, you're so good. I was like, what the hell? She goes, yeah, this other girl brought her parents with her. And I think it was a locums that was sent to them. And she brought her parents and they were just stand, sitting there while she worked, but she was just getting flustered and she didn't even know how to write prescriptions, you know? And I go, well, she shouldn't have been working locums you know, Correct. all by herself, first of all, if she's not competent, you Correct. know, competent at, at all. And, um, and then they, they said that like, she left and didn't come back, but um, she sent her parents to come pick up her check. <laughs> wow. So that's that the other thing, it. right. Yeah. That, that nurses that need to really think about as well is that if you're a new nurse, you don't get to do locum PRN or travel. Cause you know why? Yeah, at, least a, at least a couple you of don't, years. You couldn't yeah. defend it. Put up your right hand now, defend your, your experience. You have none. You will have your not learn, license, if not revoked, depending on the conduct for sure sanction. You couldn't defend that. You could not defend doing, there was a travel nurse that was a nurse for about a year went to California, was working in the emergency room. Yeah, because California is the best state to be a nurse in. So everybody wants to come here. <laughs> Little baby was in SVT. And instead of giving adenosine, gave an adult dose of potassium, baby died in the parents' arms, right? We don't, if you're a traveler, you don't, the, I've done lots of traveling, just like you, lots of locum. You need to have a lot of experience. You have to be very strong. Oh my God. You, have to you need to understand strong. already what the standard of care is. And if you don't, Lori Brown writes about this in her book. And I was just, just reading that. Again, she's nurses, uh, she's the one actually who defended Redonda. She's an RNJD. Oh, okay. Um, you know, if you don't have the knowledge, education, or training, you're not supposed to go. So think about this. I work in the cath lab where we give huge doses of adenosine for... Um, part of our procedures, 90 milligrams. We, we all know three, six, not or 12 is what you would normally give, right? I just said 90, right? And if you don't understand these drugs in your field and where you're at, so an ER nurse was floated to the emergency room and was asked to have doses that are different from the, the ICU and the patient had a bad outcome. You can't defend that conduct. If you don't, I don't care if you're floated, you cannot float to the ER. I was an ICU before I ever went to the ER. Those are not the same. You know what? An ER nurse could stabilize a patient. You know what an ICU nurse or an ICU nurse could stabilize a patient? Doesn't know how to how to manage a patient. The vice versa, the ER nurse yeah. that goes and resuscitates the patient. You walk by, patient's still flat, hasn't you know managed pressors because that's not what they do. They stabilize. If you take an assignment that you don't have experience in, I don't care what anyone says. The board of nursing will call you on it. If so, and again, it's not an issue in, in, until it is. And again, just heard about this where a nurse put a piece of equipment in place. And what do we, what's the one thing you're supposed to do if there's a piece, of, a new piece of equipment? Who's supposed to be involved? Biomed. You know what they didn't do? Involve biomed. And you know what happened? A patient almost died. And you know what? That's reportable conduct. Yeah. So crazy. <clears throat> well, it's been. Awesome having you on, Maggie. I'm sure we'll be having you on again. I hope so. Um, and to talk more about this stuff, uh, which I think we're in just a revolution of sorts. You know, it's time to go rogue. It's time to really change things. If you're not happy at the hospital you're at, like some of these um, TikTokers, these TikTok nurse advocates, um, they're all like, don't leave your place that you're at. Don't no leave. If you're not happy, things are not going to get better. And unless things do get better and you talk and you work it out, you know, but if you're not getting what you want, you know, it's time to level up and go somewhere else. There's so many different things you can do in nursing. And I've done and it. That's the perfect storm. Yeah. Again, these attorneys speak about the administrative attorneys who speak out, say the nurses knew before any event happened, they were unhappy. They were an unsafe. Yeah. Before so an event ha happened, yeah. and now you're in Maybe front of so. your board of nursing. You know, Maybe don't wait so. for you to be standing in front of your board of nursing. Don't and wait. So if you're not unhappy, leave where you're at. Yeah, you you have to leave. And I've done it so many times. We're like, oh, but the money. Oh, but that. You know, I've I've gone on um, social security before. You know, I've cashed out. I cashed out my four hundred one k. I went ahead and cashed out. There is money in other places that you can get. And let me tell you something. 
once you do that, and once you really start following your heart, money starts to come to you in other areas, you know, you create something else. Uh, you know, I mean, had I never left certain places that I just wasn't happy at, I wouldn't have gotten different experiences, you know, I wouldn't a window always right opens, here, sister. Right? Yeah. a window always no. opens, a window always opens. So these people that are giving you erroneous information, they're like, don't you strike nursing because this is what happens at the hospital. Don't tell people, well, don't you strike nursing. Correct. Had I not done strike nursing, I wouldn't have understood how the other side works. Correct. There's you know? a place for it. It's done safely. They have to petition to strike. It's not like it happens all of a sudden. They have to ask to strike. They have to ask to put things in place. And again, there's a place for it. I agree. 500%. You know, use your discernment. If you're getting called to action to go do that, if it interests you, go do it. Because guess what? You could be a writer. You could write about your situation. You know, maybe you can make it better so it doesn't happen again. You never know what can come out of it. But that is your journey. If you are feeling called to do it, then you need to go do it. If you're feeling called to leave, then you need to leave. You know, these people that are saying, telling you to do so, I was like, where are they coming from? Like, what is their experience? Clearly, they have not. I've been on a crazy journey of nursing, but looking at it in hindsight, I was like, oh, holy shit, look what I've been able to do. I mean, had I not been in certain places, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here in yep. front of, I agree uh, on my podcast, speaking to you, yep. you know? leave I, your comfort zone, get uh, out people, get I out, have, you know, I wouldn't have helped as many people as I've helped through my writing, through my writing classes and storytelling classes, you know, it's like, you got to get out of that box. And, and there's that great movie free guy, if you've ever seen it. And it's all about going from an NPC player to a main player character and learning how to play the game. And that's yep. what it is. It's like, maybe that's all you needed to do there. Maybe two years at that facility was enough to you, maybe Correct. 10 years, maybe 50, whatever. And maybe it's time for you to level up and go and do something else. Because let me tell you, if you don't, and you're seeing that, uh, you got to trust your intuition because shit's going to start happening to you. you know? I agree. Stuff is going to start happening to you because what's going to happen, you're going to be so stressed out that your subconscious program is going to boot in and you're going to be a robot now because you're just going through the motions. You're numbing yourself and just trying to get through your day for your paycheck instead of living through your heart space and doing something that you really love and, and, and really. Enjoy and that's when errors happen. And that's well spoken about. And now you're talking about your livelihood, which is the board. Right. Again, and not and, and nurses, I've seen nurses three years. They filed. They never dreamed it was going to be them. And now they file formal charges, haven't worked for three years. Don't if you're not happy, it's a matter of time where something's going to happen and you're going to be in front of the board. Don't do it. Get out. You know, I you can um, design your life the way you want it to be. I exactly. really believe that. I mean, people, there's too many that. options. There's too many there's options. Information. There's, there's options. writing, there's <laughs> clinic, there's dialysis. I mean, yeah. you and I could sit here and name 5,000 yeah. things that nurses yeah. could do. So don't tell me you can't do anything else. That's absolutely not true. It's not true. absolutely not true. Yeah. You know, all right. Awesome, Maggie. Well, thanks again. Thank and you, sister. Well. All right. Uh, tell people where they can find you. Sure. I'm an advocate's. A D V O C A T S number four nurses N U R E S at Gmail. Or you can find me on Facebook, same advocates for nurses. Please reach out to me. Love to help you. Help you, have any an, nurse. you have a Facebook group, right? Yes. Advocates for nurses is the, the handle. Twitter, same handle. You can text me 512 766 8945. That's my Google. So you're not going to bother me. I'm going to go ahead and put all that information on the show notes. So awesome. Great. Thank you, sister. Awesome. Appreciate you super having fun. me. Super fun. Thanks till next time. All right. Be well.